So let's figure out what is going on here. Let's bring in CNN national security analyst Fran Townsend. She's also a former Bush Homeland Security Advisor and Mr. David Gartenstein Ross, senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. So, Fran, we're up in Ottawa yesterday. We're working intelligence sources, not you, but others. And we are told what you are seeing here should not be minimized. It is the perfection of the threat. It is not about a big group coming here and doing a big thing. That takes too much. It's too easy for us to detect now, or at least we can. But deranged people, diseased of mind people, looking for a sense of validation and some perverse message of violence, that is very hard to control. Do you agree that this is not the easy thing to deal with? It is the hardest thing. It is the hardest thing, Chris. And I, and I do think, you know, we've we have to put together what facts we do have. We know that ISIS has called for these attacks. We know that the FBI issued a bulletin last week warning their personnel uh, about these potential attacks. Um, and, and we know that what they're looking for, what we now kind of call these hit and run attacks, right? It's the lone individual who's been inspired, whether it's by the message or by the photographs um, of other attacks. And so these really are very difficult to prevent because you don't need a large group, right? You need one person with a weapon uh, who begins to cause casualties or injuries to others uh, because of the inspiration of groups like ISIS. So, David, are we just looking at the same pool of people in the U.S. that would go shoot up a mall and then afterwards it winds up being some lamentation about how they weren't liked in high school? I mean, is this the pool we're dealing with and Islam is the new guise for their own kind of outlet for anger? It's not the same exact pool, no. There's different radicalization trajectories. There's different things that motivate people. But I don't think it's actually that bad an analogy. Uh, one thing that, that has occurred in the past few days, um, if this is an act of homegrown terrorism, then we've seen three lone wolf attacks in the U.S. and Canada in four days. To put that into context, over 15 Western countries through 2010, there have been an average of 4.7 lone wolf attacks a year. That means that we're seeing a spike right now. And uh, I think Fran is right that looking to possible ISIS inspiration is an important part or of this. Or is it just copycat? You're well, seeing yeah, it in the news. You know, they're saying, oh, that's a great avenue to dignity. Let me try that stupid thing. And then they go and, and have the same ill result. Absolutely. That, that's where I was going. I think that it's important to look at the way that ISIS has been uh, able to capture the attention of the media, the way that, uh, you know, not only uh, the Iraq and the Syria exploits being um, so uh, thoroughly covered, uh, but also each of these attacks is being covered in detail. I think it's important to both understand the gravity of this and also put it into perspective so that we don't risk valorizing these guys. Well, and on that score, uh, Fran, why are we calling them lone wolves? These guys aren't assets. There's nothing brave about them. They're not warriors of any kind. You know, even that, oh, it's a lone wolf attack. It suggests that this is someone like a sleeper cell. You know, like they've been out there and they can do it on their own. Really, this is the opposite, right? These are people who would never really be recruited by any um, more developed terrorist organization. Otherwise, they wouldn't waste an asset on a one-for-one -one proposition of killing, right? No, that's exactly right, Chris. And, and look, calling them the lone wolf, the, the whole idea is to emphasize the point that they are single actors, right? And the wolf is preying on the innocent, right? It's on the unsuspecting. I mean, when you look at the full tape, uh, surveillance tape, this guy clearly was in New York, was lying in wait behind this bus stop, waiting, watching the officers, and, and came at them when they were posing for this picture with their backs turned. I mean, this guy's a real coward. Um, but he was he had he had a plan and he was executing that plan to cause injury to these officers and clearly would have killed them if the, uh, the two uninjured officers hadn't shot him. You know, it, it is so easy to misconstrue this situation as something to kind of blow off. Uh, you know, the, the axe fool here in New York City, the Ottawa shooter, you know, uh, so terrible for the reserve corporal Cirillo up there to lose his life, the officer to be shot in the parliament, these officers to be hurt down here. But that's not that bad. We see so much worse. I think we're making a mistake when we do that because these, you know, everyone in the intelligence community, David, says, I don't know what we do to stop something like this. I don't know how we monitor thoughts in any real way. And that this is the real problem of fighting an idea is when it can take root in someone whose mind has no idea. 
Yeah, it's much more difficult to stop a lone wolf act of terrorism than it is to stop group terrorism. When you're looking at a group, then even if all the acts that they've taken uh, in support of an illegal end are legal in and of themselves, the conspiracy itself can be a crime. Whereas for a lone individual, you can't conspire with yourself. Mm -hmm. you, you have to wait until they actually cross a line. That's why the U.S. has been so aggressive about using sting operations, which are, of course, a controversial tactic. Uh, David Gardenstein-Ross, Fran Townsend, thank you very much.